I'm a former Brazilian Marine, and I'd like to report a well-known story among the Marines about the disappearance of a sergeant on an island where we usually conduct military training once a year. The Ilha of Marambeia, Marambeia Island, is an island that during the time when Brazil was still an empire, was refuge of slaves who fled the farms and gathered in communities in the most isolated parts of the island. These people are known as Quilombolas, and to this day, they still survive on the island through hunting and fishing. At one of these military trainings that takes place every year, a newly graduated sergeant made friends with one of the Quilombolas who lived there in the region. During some conversations with the Quilombola, he told Sergeant Ricardo about an ancient story of an old hidden treasure that's inside of a cave on one of the isolated areas of the island. Its old treasure was hidden there by a group of thieves who shipwrecked on the island many years ago during the time when Brazil was still an empire. However, he told Sergeant Ricardo that he should not enter the cave because any Columbula that had already entered into it never returned again, so it was known to be inhabited by a spirit who protected the treasure from outsiders. Ricardo was skeptical and did not believe much in spirits, so he asked for the Columbula to show him where the cave was. He refused to show him the cave entrance because he said that it was very dangerous. Ricardo didn't insist and decided to forget that story and just focus on the military training. Years passed and Ricardo didn't forget the story of the treasure on the island. He was thinking about how his life would change if he managed to find that treasure. The life of a marine in Brazil was very tough and the salary was low. So he dreamed of getting out of the Marine Corps one day and starting his own business, and that treasure could help him with that. So he decided that the next time he went to attend military training on the Marambeia Island. He would insist that the Quilombola show him where the cave entrance is, even if he had to offer him money to show him the way. So after a few months, Sergeant Ricardo became aware that he would be chosen to be part of the next training group on the island. So that would be his chance to change his life, and he would not let that escape. Arriving on the island, he attended the usual training drills and waited until it was his day off, which would be a day when he wouldn't have to train and he would have more time to explore the cave. He waited for dawn to go to the Quilombola's place without anyone from his squad seeing him, since exploration of the island by the military was prohibited by the officers, as there have been cases of military disappearing in previous training groups. And then he asked one of the Quilombolas to show him the way to the cave. Before he went to the Quilombola, Ricardo invited a close friend to go with him to help him find the treasure. This close friend is the person who spread the story. That you're hearing. He said that if they found the treasure, you would share it with him. The sergeant's friend refused to go because he said it was very dangerous and advised him not to go there either. He ignored his friend's advice and decided to go there anyway. After finding one of the Columbulas and insisting that he showed him the way, he agreed and took Ricardo to the entrance of the cave, where the sergeant entered in search of the treasure that could change his life. The next day, the sergeant's friend noticed that he had not returned from his search in the cave and told the officers what had happened. Search teams were requested, and it took about a week to find the entrance to the cave where the sergeant entered. After conducting searches inside the cave, they found Sergeant Ricardo's dead body. It was believed that he was lost and could not find the exit, or was possibly bit by a snake. It is said that the Marine Corps compensated the sergeant's family and hid the case from the public so that it did not appear in any newspapers. I don't know if that really happened or not, but it's a very common story in the Marine Corps that's often told by older Marines. It's said that this story happened in the early 1990s, so I think at the time it was not very difficult to hide this kind of story from the media. This happened a couple of years ago, to myself and two other friends. We were probably 17 at the time. It was summer and we had plans to go to our friend's house. There's this park that is halfway from mine and hers, so my friends and I decided it could be nice to sit in this hut in the park and have a smoke on the way to our friends. This was in the evening, so it was getting dark already, and as time passed it was dark enough for the street lights to turn on. It's important for the story to explain a bit how the hut was situated in the park. The park was shaped like a big circle around a lake, 
so the hut we sat at had two entrances from the left and right side. These entrances then connected to the main park path. The hut is open and just as bench seats in a circle and a roof, but open air, if that makes any sense. Anyways, the street lights on the right side were not working, so it was extremely dark on that side. My friends and I are chatting away and people are walking past like normal. Nothing strange. Then this man comes from the left and is walking really slowly. Now, normally this wouldn't catch my attention, but it's the summer remember, and he had on a long, thick trench coat with a top hat that had a feather in it and had sunglasses on. He walked really slowly into the dark and just stood there surrounded in it. I could only make out his silhouette just standing there. At this point, all of my friends are quiet as well and we're feeling uneasy as we're all girls. Then the man begins to walk back towards the street light that has light on the left side. He stands there for a couple of seconds, staring again. Then he proceeded to walk slowly down the path to the hut, still staring at us. We thought maybe he would just walk through and wanted to scare us, but no. He then sits down in front of us and begins to talk. For context, we live in Brussels, so he started speaking French and said, what a lovely evening, ladies. We speak and understand French, but in that moment, we knew it was smarter to pretend we didn't, so we just say, sorry, English. You can see him get agitated and mad. He starts going on this whole rant about how we should speak the language of the country. Stupid English people think they're better than everyone else. As I said, he was quite mad while saying this. I began saying to my friends, we should probably leave now. Our friend is expecting us at her house soon. Since my other friends were so scared too, the minute I said that, they said yes, and started to walk the path to the main park path. But they left their bags and everything. I had to call back to them like, guys, your bags. And they came running back, and while we're quickly gathering our things, he just stares at us. We collect our things and start walking, when suddenly we hear, hey, hey, come back here. We turn around and see him holding up the can of coke my friend had left, and he said we should not litter, and to come back and throw it away. We began to run at this point and did not look back. The whole way to my friend's house, we were so creeped out and scared that we thought he would follow us or something and any person who walked behind us caused us to panic. What scared us the most was that he had his hands in his pocket the entire time. And the moment he held up the coke can, there was something else in his hand that shined with the street light that none of us could make out. But we assumed with the shape of the object, the way the light shined on it, his behavior, and his hand in his pocket the whole time, as well as calling for us to come back, that he held a knife. We haven't seen that man since, and all of us refuse to go around that area at night now. It really scared us. I know this story might not be as creepy of an encounter as others, but this has stuck with me and my friends for a while. We have named him the Hat Man. We're not sure what that man would have done if we'd stayed any longer or had come back to throw the can out, but I'm glad we didn't find out. Be safe out there. You never know people's intentions. I live in Denver, Colorado, and I'm a sex worker. Last year, a girl went missing in Thornton, Colorado, and was shot to death. This year a few months ago, another girl went missing and was found stabbed to death, and now a girl my friend is close with has been missing since last week, and we still haven't heard from her. They are all sex workers, and I'm starting to worry that this girl could be dead because of the other two. I've contacted the police already, but nothing's been done and they still have no suspect for the shooting in Thornton. Could it be a serial killer, or am I just overthinking it? November of last year, the first girl went missing for a few days, and was found dead. Then in February, another one of our girls was found stabbed. She went missing for almost a week before she was found. Last week, another girl went missing, and we still haven't heard from her at all. We have no idea if she's safe or not. We strictly work in Denver and refuse to go out of a certain vicinity. The girls are all in their 20s and they had brown hair, and the girl who's currently missing has brown hair with two blonde streaks in the front. 
We also know to be aware of who we get into cars with or meet up with. My friend and I went to the police when the third girl went missing and mentioned the other murders so they could see if it's connected at all and that it's urgent and she needs to be found. My friend sent a message saying someone was following her and we don't know if it's related or not, but she sent a description of the guy following her. He was tallish, had brown hair, but was styled, clean-shaven, and was wearing a suit. This happened while I was working the store alone. We have cameras, and I'm a fairly big person. I'm six foot and a heavyweight athlete. I'm also female, though you couldn't really see that due to the amount of layers I was wearing. Around 12, my friend Alice came to keep me company and sat behind a trash can we have in the corner of the store next to a heater. A man pulls up in a black Lexus and is making wide-eyed eye contact with me the entire time time. It kind of made me uncomfortable, but with my size and appearance, I'm used to men gawking at me. He kept up this staring for a couple of minutes, and then the short man slinked out of his car. I say, welcome in, which was met with him swiftly starting to walk around and behind the counter where I work. I was cutting an avocado for lunch and had a knife in my hand. I got a very strange feeling and told him sternly, if you need anything, I can help you over there. You cannot be back here. Alice looked up and coughed. The man whipped around looking at Alice and briefly said, I don't need anything. And speed walks out. That left Alice and I with a terrible feeling. So Alice eventually leaves, and I sit down and study on my break, where we're pretty dead for at least the next hour usually. These three teens around my age, probably a year younger, come in. The one that started talking to me was visibly sweating and shaking with nerves, which was strange, because it was freezing outside, like you could throw water and it would turn to ice cold. Thinking nothing of it, I asked what I could get them. He blarts out, can you give me an Uber? I said, I can order you one. Which was met with, no, I have cash, can you give me an Uber home? And I said no, I can't leave the store. And I was absolutely not going to be driving strangers to God knows where. He points at a phone and a charger his friend was holding, and I said there's an outlet over there they can use. He went to plug it in by my computer, which I said, hey man, use the one over. He walked all the way to the back to get right next to my stuff, which was a little weird, but whatever. The girl with the two guys pipes up as soon as they sat down. No, you can't say that. You'd weird her out. While the other guy said, just go and ask her. They then continued to whisper something about there being plans. And you know, I'm always happy to help, but I started feeling uneasy. Then they stand up, and I kid you not, just five minutes after they sat down, they just get up and leave and say, bye, thanks for the help. And the guy who asked for the Uber pulls his keys out of his pocket and they continue to get into the car that's been parked in front of the store the entire time. It was a very uncomfortable feeling. Luckily, my manager came in shortly afterwards. It was all fairly strange. So I decided to stay in a Motel 6 for one night in the southern New Hampshire area. I had back-to-back -back hospital shifts, so it wasn't worth it to drive 45 minutes back home just to do it again six hours later. I checked in at around 11.15 p.m. and went to my room. Of course the door refused to open and the key ended up snapping in half, probably because it was 10 degrees out. So I had to go back to the office to change rooms and get a new card. My new room actually did open. It was pretty clean overall. I didn't see any major issues with it. I tried to get some sleep, but I wake up at about 4 a.m. to people arguing somewhere in the hotel. I genuinely didn't think it was possible to be so unbelievably loud between two people. This argument went on for what seemed like forever. Until they finally shut the fuck up. However, about 15 minutes later, I hear someone trying to force their way into my room. I had both locked and latched the door, yet the door somehow was cracked open and the latch was definitely about to give out. It would have opened fully if I didn't say, get the fuck out. Between the cracks, I just saw a dark figure in maybe a hoodie or jacket. 
The instant I said that, the door closed, and the person seemingly left. Now, I would have opened the door and confronted them, but I did not have my weapon on me at the time. I genuinely have no idea what could have happened if I was fully asleep and didn't hear them open the door. First and last time ever, staying at a Motel 6. For the love of God, no matter how much money you're saving by staying at a Motel 6, please, please just stay at a regular hotel. I promise you, it's worth it. I'm 40 years old now, so this actually occurred about 26 to 27 years ago. I'd gone to the mall with my mother, and being the cool and independent little shit that I was, I didn't want to walk around with my mom. I was about 13 to 14 years old, so my mom agreed to let me wander the mall and meet her at the department store in one hour. Usually, I would go window shopping or go into Spencer's Gifts to look at all the dorky stuff that teenagers liked back in the day. When the hour came up, I walked to the agreed-upon meeting spot to wait for my mom. I must have been in there for not three minutes when an older man came up to me and attempted to strike up a conversation. My parents had always warned my brother and I about the whole stranger danger situations and whatnot. However, the man seemed harmless. He started telling me that I was a beautiful young lady. He then tried to convince me to go with him to his core, because he supposedly had a camera there, and all he wanted to do was to take a quick picture of me to submit to an agency. This whole time, I began to feel like I was having an out-of-body experience. All I kept doing was giggling nervously and telling him, no. He became a bit more adamant about getting me to follow him, to the point where he started nudging my arm and pulling me so I could go outside and take this picture. Finally, as quickly as this bizarre event began, it ended. An older lady came up to us and asked him, do you know this girl? The man became visibly uncomfortable and the lady told him to fuck off. He quickly shuffled away, and she looked me square in the eyes and asked me if I was okay. In hindsight, I really don't think I knew what could have happened had I followed this creep to his vehicle. All I did was tell the lady that I was fine as I walked away to finally find my mother. Looking back, I'm so grateful for that lady. I'm not one to act like a drama queen. Or even a person who overreacts to certain situations. However, I believe that this woman may have saved my life. I will never in my life forget her or that experience. My junior year of college, five friends and I rented a dumpy three-story off-campus house. The place was old and huge, so there was always unexplained noises, and it was generally creepy to stay there alone. Anyway, one weekend in January all of my roommates were heading out of town, so I was staying there alone. The worst part of this was that during this time there had been a string of break-ins and robberies in the area around where we lived. Two people had been killed, another person was shot in a separate break-in, and if I remember right, some people had been held at gunpoint for a few hours as well. All of these break-ins occurred within a 10-block radius of our house. Needless to say, I was a little paranoid about staying there alone for the weekend, but I was able to find a little hatchet in the house. That would at least provide me some protection. That Friday night I went out with some friends, had a few beers, and got home to an empty house around midnight. I stayed up a bit longer watching TV, and passed out on the couch with my contacts in, and with the hatchet close by on the coffee table. I'm not sure how long I was asleep for, but I woke up to the sound of someone jostling the front door handle. The couch I was sleeping on was only about 10 feet from the door. I laid there, listening to the front door knob being turned, and I couldn't move. I was so terrified. Then the jostling stopped, and I heard footsteps walking off of the porch and away from the house. Still scared but able to move. I grabbed my hatchet and mindlessly stared at the TV, trying to calm down. Then I heard footsteps come up the porch to the door. I brought my hatchet into a throwing position. The deadbolt on the door turned, and the door opened, and someone walked in. Just as I was about to throw the hatchet and run in the opposite direction, I realized it was one of my roommates. Apparently his weekend plans changed and he was staying in town for the weekend. He'd been out partying, lost his house key, and remembered we had a backup key hidden along the side of the house. 
Once he opened the door, I was standing there with a murderous look in my eyes and a hatchet in my hands about to be thrown. I'm pretty sure he was as scared as me. Fifteen years later, I can still remember that feeling of sheer terror when I heard someone at the door. I'm also thankful that I'd fallen asleep with my contacts in that night, because without those, I would not have recognized the intruder. I would have thrown the hatchet at full velocity towards my roommate. Okay, so I work night shift in a maximum security psychiatric hospital. As you can probably imagine, these kind of experiences come with the territory. To set the scene for you, the hospital I work at was built in the 50s as an asylum. The concrete walls are cold and sounds echo throughout with relative ease. The pressure differentials between units and the main hall create a haunting howling sound as the air escapes through the cracks under the doors. We typically keep the lights out to encourage patients to sleep through the night. And then there's me, walking the halls alone to check that everyone is still breathing. I've heard people laughing to themselves, whispering conversations to someone unseen by me. I've even ran to emergencies where other patients have snuck into another's room to beat them violently. Having to pull a 300 plus pound man off of another man that he attacked in his sleep. All the while he's still stomping on his head. But the scariest thing was when I was doing a round and I came across one of our blind patients. You know how in the movies you see people with hallucinations that cut their eyes out looking for relief? No, I didn't find a pair of peepers freshly gouged out, if that's what you were thinking. However, this patient had in fact done exactly this a number of years ago, and as a result, was completely blind. The worst part is, it didn't make the hallucinations go away. Now all he can see are the haunting visions that brought him to it in the first place. So, this patient had been with us for some time, and every night I walk by his room, he's in the same position, standing facing the wall with his back to the door. No matter how long I stand there, he doesn't move. This is nothing new though, as I've seen a number of patients with catatonia before. They just stand or sit there with a blank or sometimes fearful expression, and react to nothing. So, the scariest part for me was when I passed by his room, walking quietly so as not to wake any patients, and I peek into his room through the window. He's standing there, facing the wall. Just before I'm about to continue on with my rounds, I see his head turn, like he heard a voice. He turns around with his empty eye sockets and looks at me. Sarah. Is that you? I nearly shit myself. I didn't even know this patient knew my name. Let alone that he could tell somehow that it was me standing there. I probably should have reassured him that I was real. But in that moment, I was so scared. I just kept on walking. Around 2006-ish, I was driving flatbed, picked up a load of construction material in rural Tennessee. My memory is foggy now, but I want to say between Memphis and Nashville, but closer to the intersection of the Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee state lines. A tarp was required, so I strapped everything down, tarped the load, and left the shipper. About five miles down the road, middle of nowhere in woods on a second lane road, I noticed my tarp flapping in the wind. I found a white shoulder and pulled over to fix it. I realized that I flat just did a shitty job tarping this load, and decided to redo it on the side of the road, I undo all the bungee straps, drag the tarps off, roll them back up, climb up on the ladder and start unrolling the tarps again. And I see a guy walking down the same side of the road I'm on, coming towards my truck. I don't think anything about it other than to keep an eye on it, because I'm in the middle of nowhere, and I continue what I'm doing. About the time I have the tarp set in place, and I'm climbing down to start hooking the bungee straps back on. This guy's getting close enough that I'm now paying more attention to him than I am to tarping my load. I grab my winch bar and set it on the trailer where I'm walking, just in case. The guy gets to me, and the first thing I notice is his hair. It's like a mullet, but it's patchy as hell. It was like he tried to cut his own hair and had a seizure in the process, and said, fuck it, good enough to party. The next thing I notice were his eyes, which I can only describe as. Like they were clear, I didn't think he was drunk or high or anything, 
but it also gave me the distinct impression that the elevator didn't go all the way up. His clothes were dirty and not well maintained, with dirty white tennis shoes. I remember he didn't have any laces on one shoe, and the tongue was noticeably out of place. He stops by me, waits till I acknowledge him. Just says, I've got a long walk. I'm like, yeah man, you do. We're in the middle of nowhere, making it clear there's no right to be had here. He nods, starts walking by me, continuing on his way, stops at about the driver door on my truck and turns around. He comes back to me and repeats himself, I've got a long walk. At this point I explain to him that I can't give him a ride, insurance, and all that. I apologize for not being able to help him out, and he seems to accept this, turns around and leaves. I wait for him to get a little ways away from my truck and start working on finishing the tarp job. I still keep an eye on it, and he's moving away from me. As I'm putting on the last of the bungee straps, I look over to check where he's at. And he's turned around, heading back towards me. Now about a hundred yards in front of my truck, and coming back my way. It looks like he's talking on a cell phone. He has his hand up to his face, and I can barely make out his moving mouth. His other hand waving like he's having a conversation with someone. I finish with the straps, grab my winch bar, and I'm climbing into my truck as he's about 10 yards away now. As soon as I'm in the cab, I lock the doors. I set the winch bar on the passenger seat, just in case. I look at the guy, and realize he's not talking on a phone. He's talking to his hand. And now I'm nervous, because he doesn't look like he's having a nice, pleasant chat. It looks more like an angry conversation. I crank the truck up, put it into gear, and just pull out. I didn't look for Tra as I pass him, he's just looking at me, still holding his hand to his face with this dead-ass look on it, just staring at me. It gave me the creeps. About the time I hit fifth or sixth gear, I look in the mirror, and there's no one there. This took place around 15 years ago. I would have been about 13 years old. My dad has always taken an annual fishing trip with friends that would put him out of state for about a week. I have numerous stories about weird things happening while he was gone on said fishing trips, from paranormal events to someone attempting to break into our house. But this one is the most unnerving to people when I tell it. When my dad would go on these trips, I would usually sleep in my parents' bed. My mom and I treated it like a little sleepover and would watch movies, stay up late and gossip, even on school nights. I remember falling asleep after a late night movie and being roused from sleep what felt like just minutes later. My mom is a light sleeper, while on the other hand, it takes a catastrophic level event to wake me up from a dead sleep. I remember waking up feeling as if something was wrong. The room was illuminated oddly, and there was a distant rhythm I was only partially aware of. I'm half asleep, and as I open my eyes, I can see my mom on top of the bed, on her knees, peering out of the window above her bed. I started to ask. What's going on, when she turned to me quickly, and shushed me. I quietly joined her looking out of the small box window that was slightly cracked open, and the distant, rhythmic chanting became more and more clear. Our house sat in front of a strip of woods. The trees aren't too thick and you can't see through most of the wooded area. The chanting was getting louder by the second, and the odd allusion to the sound of the finally made sense. You could see a line of hooded figures in dark clothes, holding torches marching east, chanting what sounded like demonic, dark things. It felt surreal and scary as we held our breath, waiting to see what they would do. Were they headed towards the houses to burn them down? Were they going to attempt to break in and sacrifice us? It felt like ages that we sat there, watching this line of people walk through the woods. Their torches raised high, and their chanting continuing through the night. But that was it. They just walked away. After what was probably more like two minutes, my mom and I laid back down and discussed what we saw, trying to get back to sleep. We told my dad first thing in the morning when he called to check in but I remember him not believing us. He thought it had to be a dream or something. That kind of thing didn't happen in our small town in Ohio. 
But the next day, there was an article in the local newspaper about a lamb being slain on a makeshift altar on the east side of my town. My dad stopped doubting us, and my mom and I got even more freaked out. My parents still live in that house, and we've never seen any other cult-like behavior in the area. But that one evening freaked us out enough that I decided to permanently camp out in my parents' bedroom every time my dad left town, until my late high school years. If you stuck around, I appreciate it. Thanks for listening and allowing me to get my story out there. My friends and I were reminiscing about creepy stories this weekend. This one came up, and I haven't stopped thinking about it since. So I wanted to write it down and share.